I was blessed when I came across this here this week, and it's actually in my notes to share some thoughts to that end, but then I put an X through it because I just don't know if I'm going to have enough time to get through all of what I have. I have a bunch here. So we're singing uh, this song that we love to sing, Standing on the Promises of God That Cannot Fail. Amen? We, we would agree with that, right? Do you know the nature of us, though, is to demand from God an explanation as to why things are the way they are. Can you think of Job in particular? Job wanted an audience with God in the worst way, and he continued to really ask for an audience with him. And uh, God, wasn't, God wasn't going to do that. God doesn't owe us anything. He doesn't owe us a personal audience. But what Job was really looking for was just some kind of explanation. Lord, why, why are you allowing this to happen to me? Uh, all the things that are going on. I, I've walked with you. I've loved you. I've served you. I, I've done all these things. And, and Lord, you've taken away everything I've ever known, everything I've ever loved. And, and he didn't understand it. And understandably so. Uh, we can identify with Job. And then I came across this thought here that, that uh, it's not explanations that are going to carry the day. It's the promises of God that will carry us through the trials of life. Uh, think of this. Uh, the illustration is given. Uh, if you go, Carolyn in particular, break an arm and they take an x-ray of your arm and the doctor comes in and begins to explain to you all about the process of x-raying. He's going to explain to you what an x-ray is, what it does, how it does all these kind of things. And I ask the question, does that heal the arm? Does that fix the problem? No, it may give you some comfort to know, okay, that they can do these incredible things today with modern technology and things of that sort. But it doesn't heal the problem. But if he promised you that, hey, listen, uh, it looks like it's going to be okay in a few weeks. It, it looks like it should heal on its own. That's comforting. That's the comfort. The promise is the comfort, not the explanation. But the nature of man is we want God to explain himself to us as to why this is going on in our world. And it's like, who are we? Who are we to demand such an audience with God? You know, God says, I've given you my book. I've given you the promises. Just trust the promises. Stand on the promises. They will not fail. That's what will bring you comfort. That's what will heal your soul, the promises of God. And so uh, as we were singing that, thought, that song, Pastor Josh had no idea I was going to share some of those thoughts, but I thought, boy, that is just really timely. So let's just do the course. Can we do the course one more time here? You really don't need the words, but standing on the promises here, we'll just do the chorus, and I want you to sing out like you're really believing. Standing, standing, standing. Here we go. Ready? Are you standing on the promises of God, or are you like Job, demanding an audience and an explanation from God as to why life is the way it is in my world? Don't go down that road. It's a dead-end street. It's not going to help you. Just stand on the promises of God. He'll carry you through. Amen? I really hope that song will take on some new meaning to you as you look at that and sing it over and over and over again. It's a favorite of many. Praise the Lord. All right, uh, we're going to take our Bibles and go to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 6, for our study this morning, Ecclesiastes 6. And as we are doing that, we're going to dismiss our youngsters, 6th grade and under, can head downstairs to Children's Church. Trust the Lord will bless as they head down yonder here. And I trust the Lord will bless us as we remain up here in the auditorium looking at God's Word. Ecclesiastes, chapter 6. had that maybe I didn't hit the on button well enough here that's the problem I didn't get the on button well enough there we go thank you Chris appreciate that very much the theme for the month of June is left wanting uh, we looked at the first nine verses of this short chapter here in Ecclesiastes chapter 6 and uh, somebody has given uh, this the title instead of left wanting they have entitled maybe chapter 6 Possessing everything, enjoying nothing. 
Uh, that's pretty profound, and I think that that really does depict the chapter here. We said last week that we are left wanting, and that really is this ugly part of life here. If you look at verse 2 and 3, and we could read it all, but here, if you look at this, God has given riches and wealth and honor so that this individual has no need of anything. There's no want for anything. Uh, look at verse 3. If a man beget a hundred children and live many years, so the days of his years be many. Long life, big family. This guy is blessed, and yet he is left wanting. For both of those texts incorporate this thought. Verse 2 again. God giveth him not power to eat thereof. He has it all, but it seems like it's all taken away from him before he gets to really enjoy it. He's left wanting. You come to verse 3, you see that his soul be not filled with good. Again, the man is blessed beyond measure, and yet he is left wanting and hungry. That's the ugly part of being left wanting. We looked at verses 3 through 5 dealing with this area of the unfortunate scenario that's played out in this area of left wanting, and it deals with the untimely birth of a child. Solomon would say is better than the individual that is alive and well. And uh, that, that just does not resonate with me, but I understand where Solomon's coming from. The unborn child never has to experience the life that you and I experience. Now listen, I hope that you live your life with the glass half full. I hope that you find good in everything. Uh, it's easy to, to slide down and start murmuring and complaining and and uh, it's, it's the sin nature of man to find the fault of the day as opposed to the many blessings that God gives us. So I would never want to get to a place where I would think, boy, it's better to be dead than alive. I, I don't want to get to that place. And yet we've already read that in chapter 5. And here he's talking about the untimely birth of a child. Uh, never has to experience life like you and I would experience. But I'll tell you... I, I'll take life any day over death. I, I will. I, not, not to say that death isn't inevitable. It's coming. It's going to knock on our door. It's going to take us one of these days. We just don't know when. We all know it's going to happen, but we're all shocked when it does. But listen, life is a gift, and I hope and pray that you use it well. And that's what he'll say in the latter part of these verses. In fact, verse 9, the urgent with regard to this, this void in life is that uh, enjoy what is before you. Better Verse 9 says, is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the desire. Uh, the, uh, the better is what you have. The, the bird in hand is, is worth more than two in a bush. Uh, uh, this is the day that God has given you. Rejoice, be glad in it. Make the most of this day. Uh, don't wait for tomorrow. Don't put all your eggs in the basket of tomorrow's coming and boy, I can't wait. And yet we're all guilty of that. Maybe you got a vacation coming up. Some of you are coming off a little vacation. Maybe that vacation, boy, you've been dreaming of, planning, and thinking of for a long time. You just can't wait. You may never get that vacation. Or that vacation may come and not be all that you intended it to be. So I would say, hey, listen, today's the day that God has given you. If the vacation comes tomorrow, that's great too. But hey, today's the day. Enjoy today. Don't be left wanting was the idea. Hey, we're going to pick up with part two of this whole uh, narrative here, and we're going to look at three verses, 10, 11, and 12 of the text. And I want you to understand here that it's the same scenario. It's part two of the same message, left wanting. Don't be left wanting. And the first thing we're going to see here in verse 10 is that man has a deficiency. Man, man has a problem. There's the deficiency. Man is but dust. Uh, man is uh, one that falls short of the glory of God time and again, and he really is no match for the omnipotent creator God. What is man? Uh, there's, there's a real shortcoming in the life of all of us here. That's our deficiency. Then I want to see that man has a dilemma as well. And the dilemma is man has so much. We have so much. But the question is, are we better off because of all that we have? Do you know, I found that sometimes some of the poorest people are the happiest people in the world. They have so much less than you and I do. And yet the little they have, they are savoring. They are enjoying it. They're basking in it. They're making the best of what they have. They're happy people. Uh, I was, uh, had the privilege of being in Haiti many years ago, and, and uh, I believe Haiti is probably still deemed the poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere. It's very, very poor. 
And believe me, they have very, very little down in that country. And yet they are some of the sweetest people I have probably ever met. Um, they are just sweet, sweet people. Uh, I had an interpreter work alongside of me for many hours each day. And, uh, you know, the pay that he received, I, I, was, I was actually insulted, but again, it's all part of a system. But uh, I was told by the veteran missionary that I was with is, hey, listen, this man is happy. Uh, he can go home and feed his family for the day. He's a happy man. And I'm thinking, well, that's all well and good for today, but what about tomorrow and the tomorrows to follow? And, and yet uh, that is where they live. They live literally from day to day, and they're happy in each day. They, they really savor that moment. Well, we have so much at our disposal but I do ask this question, are we better off as a result of it? And that's verse 11. In verse 12, I want you to understand that man needs to discover this truth. We don't have to be left wanting. There are going to be some questions that, that the Solomon's going to ask here in verse 12. And uh, I'm happy to tell you that, that the answer to the questions are found in God. Uh, it's not found in this world and it's not found in man. It's found in God. And so... So that is the discovery that we need to make with regard to the understanding of this particular chapter. Man's discovery is that God has the answers to the questions of life, and that is good. And then I just want you to understand this is by way of introduction. We're going to get to this deficiency here. We're going to hone in on that in just a minute. But I want you to understand that at verse 10, Solomon is beginning, now listen to this, beginning the conclusion of the book. He's actually turned the page. He's really no longer going to uh, get into this idea of all the experiments of life that he tried to find satisfaction and happiness. He's really now going to kind of point us in a different direction and give us some practical pointers with regard to how to overcome some of those things in chapter 7 through 12. So this really is the halfway part of the book when you get here to verse 10. And it really is beginning this conclusion. But I thought about this. I thought if... I thought I was a long-winded preacher. This boy has six more chapters to write, and he's in his, the beginning of his conclusion. So, you know, when you hear the preacher say, in concluding, you can understand this. That means absolutely nothing. Uh, if I say, uh, and, and wrapping this up, sit back and relax, because that could still be another 30 minutes. Uh, and that's about what Solomon is doing here as he begins to write uh, some of these verses. It's evenly divided, 111 verses up to verse 9, 111 from here through chapter 12, verse 8. The last six verses of chapter 12 really are the epilogue, and we'll talk more about that when we get to it. So it's really interesting. He's beginning to put some things together from the past, and he's beginning to prepare us for the future here with regard to what he has to say. The first half really dealt with his search for happiness, satisfaction, contentment. The last six chapters of the book really will be his answers as to what can be found in that area. So let's look at the deficiency of man here. Let's look at this here beginning in verse 10. <coughs> verse 10, we read this. That which hath been is named already, and it is known that it is man. Neither may he contend with him that is mightier than he. This is an interesting passage of scripture. And believe me, I have spent hours and hours and hours really trying to look over this particular text. That which hath been named, or that which hath been, is named already. What is Solomon trying to tell us? He's talking about things that have already in existence already have a name. The fact that they have names speaks of an authority who had the ability to name those things names. I was thinking of practical applications. For instance, the hibiscus bush. Uh, where did the name hibiscus come from? What is the original meaning of that? I, I have no idea. But somebody who has much more knowledge in the area of horticulture understands what the hibiscus bush is all about, and they named it hibiscus. A hibiscus bush differs than a geranium. Why is a geranium named a geranium? I have no idea what the name means. But I do know this. The authority over those plants many years back has deemed those plants a certain name, and we all know what they mean. Nothing has changed. Hibiscus is still hibiscus. And by the way, out in visitation here a couple weeks ago, I ran into an Indian lady, and we were talking about hibiscus bush. We talked for 20 minutes about 
horticulture. And she was asking me questions. It's like, you got the wrong guy. My wife was with me, so she could help her out a little bit more. But she told me that there's an Indian hibiscus bush that, uh, that you actually take the, uh, the, the flowers and you can grind them all up here, and then they rub that in their hair. The oil and all that comes out of that stuff is really healthy for you. And I was like, well, I don't know. My hibiscus bush is from Costco. Is that the same? She said, no, 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 it's not the same. It's not the Indian hibiscus. But they understand hibiscus. And uh, if you ever had one of those, you'll know what that means as well. Names. People have authority. Uh, remember a baseball team called the Cleveland Indians? Remember those teams? That team? That was great, right? Well, now it's an offense. So we have the Cleveland Guardians. Somebody was talking about the Guardians the other day. Guardians, Guardians. Who are the Guardians? If you told me the Indians, I would have known who the Indians were, but I don't know who the Guardians are. Same thing with Washington Redskins. Washington, I think, went a whole year without another uh, a team name or whatever, and I think they finally became the Commanders, I guess, or whatever, but it was just Washington. Oh, the Washington. Oh, it's playing the Philadelphia Eagles. Hey, but, but who has the authority to do that? Well, well, apparently the NFL or the Major League Baseball, uh, they have the authority, but naming something indicates authority. You get that picture? I remember as a kid, sometimes we nickname things. Uh, my, my, we, we had an old Chevy, one of those big old Bel Air Chevy station wagons. Had to be probably late 50s, early 60s, whatever. You remember them big old fins on the back of that stuff? My father used to call that car Betsy. I don't know where Betsy came from. I know where Betsy ended up. Uh, I remember when Betsy was turning, the odometer was turning 100,000 miles. Uh, that was a big deal back in the 60s, folks. Now, I know I'm dating myself here, but, but uh, back in the 60s, like, man, everybody was like glued to the odometer as you're riding down a road. Here it comes. There's seven tenths, eight tenths, nine, 100,000. And it's almost like he should take the car and drive it right to the junkyard because that's it. It's over. 100,000 miles is all those cars got. At least that's what they thought. Today, 100,000 miles, you're just getting warmed up. Amen? I mean, these cars are going forever and ever and ever. I like that. I heard about the pastor that had a boat, and he named it Visitation. Every time you called the pastor, he was out on Visitation. He was a real spiritual pastor. I mean, this pastor, he loved to visit, I'm telling you. Actually, I think Isaiah's dad has a boat named Visitation as well. So I was thinking that. But I really did hear about a pastor that was thinking of doing that. I don't know if he actually named it. But you get the idea? If you are the one in control, one that has the authority, you can name whatever you want to name. You got that? Let's go to the book of Genesis in your mind. We don't have time to look there. Genesis chapter 1. There are terms that are used that are still being used today. And by the way, in case you got lost here, that which hath been is named already. Who named day, day, and night, night? Who called light, light, and darkness, darkness? Who was it that deemed firmament, and the word waters, and heaven, and earth, seas, and grass, trees, fish, fowl, cattle? And are you ready for it? Man. In fact, did he not deem it male? And female, whoa, hey, that which hath been is named already. Male still means male, regardless of how one wants to identify himself. Amen? Amen. Male means male, and female means female. Hey, that which hath been is named already. In the Jewish mind, giving a name to something is the same as fixing a character with that item. It's starting with that which is and identifying and fixing character to that. For instance, light is still light. Light will never be darkness. Day is still day. Day will never be night. Male is still male. And male will be nothing other than male until the Lord comes back. And changes it. I don't see that happening anytime soon. It is God that is called evil, evil. It is God that is called good, good. It's already named. But Isaiah warns us, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. 
You see where we're living today? Folks, this is relevant to the day and age in which we're living. We want to change terminology. We want to change names. We don't like male and female. We don't like evil. We want to call evil good and good evil. Now, wait a minute. God is the authority. He's called these things what they are, and I don't see him changing anytime soon with regard to that. And it's in that vein that he called man Adam. And Adam simply means from the earth. Nobody can change that. We came from the earth, and we will return to the earth. Man, by any other name, will still be man. Made from the dust, and to dust we will return. This is the illustration. You can call the tail of a dog a leg. But I ask the question, how many legs does a dog have? Four. Thank you. Four. You can call the tail anything you want to. It doesn't change it. It's still a tail is a tail. Call it a leg. Doesn't make any difference. This naming implies power and control and authority. It really indicates that there is a God who is sovereign and in control. We've already looked at this idea in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. You needn't turn back to that. But to everything there is a season, a time to every purpose under the heaven. There's a time to be born and a time to die. We talked some about that early, early on in this service here. There's a time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted. You get the idea. Time to kill, a time to heal. It goes on and says that he, that's God, hath made everything beautiful in his time. And then verse 14 says... I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nothing, or, nor anything taken from it. God doeth it that men should fear before him. Hey, in the naming of things, God is sovereign. He's in charge. It would do us well to acknowledge that, uh, to, to fear before him, uh, to worship and reverence the God who has given us these different names and titles to what we have. And it really kind of hones in on this one area, dealing with man. Look at the next verse. He says in verse 10, that which hath been is named already, and it is known that it is man, or that he is man. That pronoun can be used as he. This is the only time in the book of Ecclesiastes where the word man, Adam, is without any modifier or any extra Hebrew verbiage that would make it a generic form for man. No, this is very specific when he talks about man in this particular text. The, the preacher is being deliberate in using this word, and he wants to remind the readers of this particular letter here that this is God who has made man from the dust of the earth. Listen to a text found in Genesis chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. I never saw this in my life, all right? So this is all new to me. I know a little bit of it, but I didn't know the latter part of it. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, this is the book of the generations of Adam. I understand that. They're going to give us the genealogical record of his descendants. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him, made man. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam. Wait a minute, I thought his name was Adam. No, their name is Adam. Male and female, made from the same substance, dust. In calling their name Adam, God is connecting mankind with our origin. We came from the dust, and we are still dust. Now listen, God has declared man uh, and given him this authority over the earth. But man is still a vessel, a vessel made of clay. We are still dust. John chapter 9, remember when the blind man couldn't see, Jesus spit on the ground. He made clay and took that clay and healed the man with this dust. Now, why did he do that? He could have just simply spoken to that man and the man would have been healed. But he chose to use clay that particular day. Romans chapter 9 tells us that the potter has power over the clay. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 tells us that there is a treasure, I believe that's the gospel message, that has been entrusted to earthen vessels, 
vessels of clay, vessels of dirt. It is true that man is made in the image of God, but make no mistake about this. Man is not God. We are a special creation of God, but we are made from dust and will never be God, even though we're made in His image. Though a man could make himself master of all the treasures of kings and provinces, yet he is still man. And Scripture says that. Scripture says in the book of Psalms, chapter 9, verse 20, Put them, the heathen, the unbelievers, in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. You know, sometimes we get this idea that we are really something special. Hey, listen, we are special because of what Christ has done. And anything that has been a good or, or, or anything that we've ever accomplished, all the glory goes to God. It's not because you are smarter, uh, you are, you're, you're wealthier, uh, you have a different upbringing. It's because of what God has done in your life. All the credit goes to God. But, but never lose sight of this, but we are just simply but dust. Formed and shaped and, yes, have a personal and breathing of God. The very breath of life has come into us, made and molded into the image of Christ. But, but we have come from dust. You know, we were uh, out in visitation this last week here, and uh, I, I found it fascinating. I still haven't had time to really process all of this thought here, but we had some phenomenal contacts. And one of the contacts was with a man who had originally didn't want to give us the time of day, but stood at the door for probably at least 10 or 15 minutes, talking about, how can a sinner believe on God? How can a sinner get right with God? I mean, why would God want to reach down and save this sinner? And uh, it was really a phenomenal conversation. But it reminded me of the truth that we are but sinners. We are but dust. There is nothing great or glorious in us apart from God. And God has reminded us by way of this particular test that we are just that. We are atoms. We are just, we are just made of the dirt of ground. So he goes on in that same text and says this. Look at the next verse. That which hath been is named already, and it is known that it is man. Neither may he, that's man, contend with him, that's God, that is mightier than. He now really going to put it in perspective. Who are we to contend or argue with God? Who are we? He's the, he's the molder. He's the one that shaped us. He's the one that has given us life and breath. God is mightier, stronger. So here's just a simple admonition with regard to that latter part of that verse. It doesn't pay to argue with God. God wins every argument. Mark that down in your mind. Remember we talked about certain principles that, uh, that, that ought to be embedded into our being? Hey, the sooner we can learn this, the, the better off we're going to be. But you know, I have a feeling we're much like Job. We want to argue. We, we, we want to contend with God. Hey, listen, God wins every argument. I want to encourage you to raise the white flag a lot quicker than you have been doing in the past. Instead of trying to, again, figure it all out, just let God be who God is. Understand that God's ways are above our ways. That God knows the, what's best for us. That God will never give us more than we can bear. That, that God has a purpose and a plan for allowing whatever it is that comes our way. Just throw up the white flag and say, God, you be God. And I will remind myself that I am but dust. Who am I to contend with you? I am nothing. As already indicated, Job desired this. And I want you to listen to Job's response. You know, you read through the book of Job, great book. Love Job. Every time I read it, love it even more. And uh, Job is often asking God for, again, an explanation. We already talked about some of that. Uh, finally, he has that audience with God. When you get to the latter chapters, chapter 40 of the book of Job, God appears to Job. And God says, Shall he, you, Job, contendeth with the Almighty in, uh, uh, and instruct him? He that reproveth God, let him answer him. Job, you've wanted this argue this 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 day, your day in court. You wanted this time with me. You've been you've been trying to have this audience and, and argue with me and contend with me. Hey, Job, speak for yourself. You know how Job responds? The very next verses, verse three and four. Job answered the Lord and said, 
Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay my hand upon my mouth. End of discussion. It's over. Who am I? I like to tell a favorite story of mine. Uh, it's not in my notes, but it came to my thought with regard to putting my hand on my mouth and learning just to zip it. Uh, there was no question in my house when I was growing up who the authority figure was, my father. He ruled the roost. Uh, I often tell people that when he said jump, you didn't ask how high, you just started jumping. He'd tell you whether it was high enough or not. That's a slight exaggeration, but he was in charge. You knew that. You didn't question that too often. Uh, one time he told me to do something, and uh, I had such bad attitude. I'm not proud of that at all, but I learned a valuable lesson that day. And the way I asked him, it was in a huff, it was with attitude, and I really should have got nailed. I've been nailed before a couple times. And that day, I deserved it. He sat in his chair that day and chose not to give me the back of his hand or anything else. He simply said, because I said so. That's why. And you know, at that point in time, the discussion was over. He won again. He was the authority. He said to do this, who am I to question him? He's the authority. And he should have gave me what I deserved, but that day he taught me a valuable lesson. And I don't think he intended to do that, but I sure learned a lesson. I put my hand on my mouth. It's over. The discussion is over. Job doing the same thing. Wanting, demanding, some kind of explanation. God appears. Okay, Job, have at it. All of a sudden, I am vile. Who, who am I to demand such an... Who are we to contend with God? The preacher here is re really reviewing the result of his long and extensive inquiry. That which hath been, really, I think, takes us back to really the early writings of this book. What he was looking for and exploring, the wisdom, the pleasure, the honor, the riches... These all have already been named. All is made bare at this point in time. It all is vanity, including the creation of man. Psalm 39, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Folks, you sit there, you listen to this, and you think, this is kind of like depressing. I think it's good to have a right view of ourselves. I really do. I, I, I think that it's too easy for us to think that we are something special. I, I prefer to go through life viewing myself this way. And I dare say, because when I get to eternity, I don't think it's going to be any different. When I step into the presence of the Lord, I often use the exaggeration, I'll probably be on my face for the first billion years before I can even begin to look at my Creator God. The God that loved me so much that He sent His Son to die in my place. Like, who am I to be in His presence? I am but dust. I'm not worthy. I'm not deserving. I think there's a health to that kind of approach in life. And I really think maybe Solomon is trying to help us understand some of that here in this particular text. Man is deficient and left wanting. That's what I get out of verse 10. Verse 11, I want you to see this, that man also has a dilemma. Verse 11. The dilemma is that he has so much... But he asked the question, is he really better off because of all that he has? And by the way, you remind, remind you of the text here. Remember, Solomon was never satisfied, always looking for more. He had everything he could have ever wanted and then some. And still, there was an emptiness. There was a void. There was a vanity, a vexation of spirit, just chasing the wind. And listen, that's, it hasn't changed in all the years. So here's the dilemma. Man has so much, but is he better off? with it. Look at verse 11. Seeing there be many things that increase vanity, the futility or emptiness of life, what is man the better? The idea of seeing there be many things really again is maybe the conclusion of the foregoing chapters. He's looked at all of life and uh, seeing including man as vain and yet man still vying for more, more attention, more things. Wisdom, pleasure, power, wealth, whatever it might be. Past, present, future, all partake of the same vanity. Hey, folks, even the good things, even the good things of this life bring so much toil and care and fear. Um, 
you know, having a child. What, what a blessing. What, what a blessing to be able to bring a child into this world. But think of the responsibility that comes with that, that, that blessing. For, for the rest of your life, you will be a parent. And you say, well, yes, but my child, Lord willing, someday will grow up, get married, and move on. You're still a parent. You now have more responsibility because now you take on the, the outlaw, uh, the grandchildren, uh, the great-grandchildren. Uh, by the way, you do know the difference between an in-law and an outlaw, don't you? Outlaws are wanted. In-laws are not. Uh, I know, I know. Yeah, think on it here. Think, I know. You're a little slow. We've got to wake you up here this morning. Got to get with it here. I have outlaws in my family. I have lots of them. But listen, even the good things of life, the good things can bring pressure and stress and challenge. And it's all the result of the fall. This is all, again, a result of our sin nature. We are buried under an infinite number of carnal appetites, as somebody wrote, keeping us really down, bogged down to this earth. And vanity is now an essential part of the constitution of our makeup. The emptiness, never satisfied, always wanting more. Seeing there be many things that increase vanity, many things that increase this emptiness, is man really better off? What advantage does man have? with regard to the things that he has. Does it bring satisfaction, contentment, happiness? No, I think the text tells us that it's all vanity. We want, but we don't have. We have, but we can't use. We use, but are not satisfied. Contentment and happiness are but phantoms. Sometimes we're no better off, no happier, no richer. With the thing that you thought would bring you the satisfaction and the contentment, it just didn't happen. It's not there. So again, I ask the question, what advantage does man have? This is a question that is repeated throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. What profit had the man of all his labor? What's the, what's the profit? In this particular chapter, Solomon really is uh, telling us that life, in this case, is a dead-end street for two kinds of people. Those who have riches but no enjoyment. Those who labor but have no satisfaction. Contentment and happiness are not an automatic for making life grand and glorious. It is the blessed byproduct of making a good life. Too many people think, boy, if I have this, I'll have a good life. No, a good life is a product of, again, walking with God and being blessed of God. You don't need things. If you devote your life only to the pursuit of happiness, you'll end up miserable. Take it from Solomon. However, if you devote your life to doing God's will, you will find the blessedness, the contentment, the satisfaction in God and in this world. Again, I told you, it's not some of the poorest people I've met are some of the happiest people. They don't have much, but they're happy. They've learned to find satisfaction in that. It was the British poet Joseph Addison that said this in the late 1600s. The grand essentials to happiness in this life are three things, something to do, someone to love, and something to hope for. The three grand essentials to happiness in this life. Addison probably didn't have much Christianity in mind when he wrote that, but that's the truth for a Christian. We have all three of those in Christ. We have something to do, we have someone to love, and we have something to hope for. The preacher was not finished. He said, there's this dead-end street, but there's a third kind of person. Not just those who have riches but no enjoyment. Not just those who labor but have no satisfaction. But the person who requires answers to life's questions. Solomon is not condemning the questioning. He's condemning the direction. He was a man, after all, that had this investigative nature and wanted to find satisfaction. And he ended up finding it in the very promises of God, as already indicated. I want you to see man's discovery here in verse 12. Verse 12 deals with man does not have to be left wanting. He can find the answers to these questions in God. There are two questions that will be asked in verse 12. First question, for who knoweth what is good for man? I'll save the rest for another time. 
The second question is after the question mark. For who can tell a man what shall be after him? Two questions. The uncertainty of life tomorrow is as bad, if not worse, than the uncertainty of life after death. You know, there are a lot of people that are consumed with what will happen to me when I die. And that's a good consumption. You better be ready for that. There is life beyond the grave. Somebody has said that death is only a comma at the end of the, sec at the, end of the sentence. It is not a period. Death is just simply passing through. There is another life to come. And that's the life we be, better be ready for. And there's only one way to be ready for it, and it's through faith in Jesus Christ and him alone. This text here really deals with human beings not possessing control over the future. Who are we to demand answers again with what is good for man in this life? Or who can tell what will be after him, not just in the eternity to come, but even in the here and now? In Ecclesiastes 6, uh, Solomon is reminding the readers that contentment is more satisfying than wealth. Doing God's will is more important than gaining goods. Doing God's will brings the highest wealth of all. And as so with that thought in mind, I was taken to the book of, uh, uh, of Mark, uh, the, the, the Gospel of Mark. And, and folks, if you get nothing else out of this message, pay attention to these, just these next few words. Mark chapter 10, Jesus is addressing the same subject. He comes at it from a little bit different of an angle. You're familiar with it, but it, it really struck me odd this time. I, I never really thought about it this way. He's speaking about finding satisfaction and it's not in possessions, family, or longevity. He says in Mark chapter 10, listen to these verses 29 and 30. You can go back and look at it later. Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake and the gospels. But he shall receive, now listen to this, a hundredfold when. When will he receive... When does the dividends begin to be paid out for this individual, this servant of the Lord, who has left it all to serve the Lord? When will the dividends be paid out? He said, this man will receive a hundredfold now in this time. Houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands. He goes on and adds, with persecutions, that really speaks of great trials, in the world to come, eternal life. All right, here's what I want you to know. I don't know about you, but I have often wondered, uh, I, I truly am blessed. And, and I don't just stand before you and just, uh, you know, uh, I, I analyze my life. I hope that you do that as well. And, and I often wonder, why, God, have you been so good to me? I, again, I, I don't really understand it. I, I, I say that in all truthfulness. Uh, again, if you, if you knew all that I have and saw all that I have and could, could enjoy what I have, I'm telling you, you'd have to say, blessed beyond measure. And that is the truth of the matter. It's not to say I don't have my ups and downs in life or challenges like you do, but I am blessed. And then I'm reading this particular text where Jesus is speaking. And he tells us here that, that those that are willing to give it all up for the cause of Christ, give it all up, not some, all of it up. Family, possessions, Everything you own, surrender it to the Lord. Give it all to him, not some, all. And God says, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to bless you in this life as well as the world to come. Now, folks, I know you know the text. And I'm not standing before you saying that I am this great servant of the Lord who has surrendered all. But I learned a long time ago some of these principles I'm trying to help you with. Like, like, stop arguing with God. Really, stop that. Raise, raise the white flag. He wins. Just settle that. And settle this. Give everything you have to him today. Don't hold it back. Don't think, well, well, I need this, or I need that. Or my family is more important. Or my possessions. I could tell you, tell you about the, 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 the wonderful position I had when I was with Amtrak for 14 years, the house I lived in, the church we attended, the blessings we had. We, we loved where we were. 
We weren't running from anything. God simply said, I want you to serve me. Well, Lord, you know, let's see, at that point in time, I think I had, let's see, four, five, six, uh, I had a, uh, at least six kids, I think it was. Yeah, six. It's like, Lord. In fact, when, when we went forward and surrendered our life to serve the Lord, I had a deacon come to me afterward and said, Brother, what are you doing? He said, People with six kids don't surrender to go serve the Lord. I mean, what do you think about this? What are you doing? Six kids? Like, how are you going to do this? I don't know, Paul. I know Paul Snyder real well. I love Paul Snyder. Paul, I don't know. I just know this. God's called me. Who am I to argue with him? I wave the white flag. I surrender. I'm going. And I went. And people say, you're crazy. No, listen. He's sovereign. He's in charge. He knows the end from the beginning. Who am I to argue? And so we surrendered. And time and time again. Uh, I, I could tell you the salary I went from to the salary that I took on. And it didn't make any difference in my opinion. I figured if I had to be a tent maker like Paul, I'd work. I don't really care. I just know God has called me to go serve him, and I'm going to serve him. And then you talk about getting possessive. I have 10 kids. I love my kids. I have a great relationship with my kids. I wish my kids all lived around me, but they don't. They live as far as Madagascar. You talk about hurt. You talk about like, ah, oh, Lord, can't you have them be a missionary right here in Kendall Park? Nope, Madagascar, you're going. Who am I to argue with God? Raise the white flag. He's in charge. Surrender it all. God will bless you. Do you believe that? I'm not so sure Christians believe that. I'm not so sure. And I just want to try to convey to you that, that it's only by God's grace. I'm living proof of the blessings of God. And it's not to say that I'm the greatest servant that ever walked the face of the earth. But I've learned a few things in life. Don't hold it back. What is good for man in this life? He talks about the, the, the vain things of this earth. It's but a shadow. It appears here and it's gone tomorrow. Hey, listen. The things that you're accumulating for all of eternity, you'll bask in it for all of eternity. Lay up your rewards in heaven. Somebody says, well, you know, going to ministry doesn't pay much. The dividends and the riches are out of this world, and that's the truth of the matter. God blesses in tremendous ways. And if I could try to help you understand that and just say today, I want to give it all to you, Lord. I'm not holding it back. I'm telling you, uh, I get riled up, and that's why I say if anything you get out of the message, take Mark chapter 10, verses 29 and 30 with you as you go your separate way. No man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels, but that he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands. You know, isn't that exactly what happened to Job? Job had it all, and he lost it all. Now, I don't know if he freely gave that of God. God chose to take that. But what did God do in the end? He restored double. He restored double. And that's really the way it is. So, folks, it is really a sickening prospect if this world will be our all. If, if, you're, if you're counting on this world to fill all the needs, I feel bad for you. I really do. Who knoweth what is good for man? I submit to you there's one person, and that's God. I don't know what's good for me, but God does. And he tells me by way of his word what is good. And if I just do as he tells me, God blesses. So may our prayer be this. Lord, while the future is clouded in darkness, and no man can tell what shall be after me, let me lie passive in thy hand, be active in thy present work, and all will be peace. Whatever be, let it be thy choice for me, not mine for myself. So listen, if you struggle in any of those areas, just ask yourself today before you leave today or sometime throughout the day, Lord, I don't know what is good for man. I think I do. I thought I do. But Lord, really, I find... Your answers are what I need. Wise is the person that takes time to listen to God for what he has to say. 
Life is fleeting. It's elusive. It is like a soap bubble. It's vanity. It's but a shadow. All of this we've looked at in six chapters already. But he that does the will of God will abide forever and be blessed beyond measure. The second question quickly, what shall be after him? In spite of the astrologers, the prophets, the fortune tellers, nobody can claim the future except God. It is futile to speculate. God gives us enough information to encourage us today. That's all I need. That's all I need. I don't need all the answers to tomorrow. He gives me enough today. He does not cater to idle curiosity. One thing is sure. Death is coming, and we had better make the best of what we have today. Surrender to the Lord. Watch what God will do with it. I had a pastor friend of mine. I'll close with this story. I uh, spoke, or I had him come actually speak at one of our uh, meetings. I liked the man very much. He had some kind of terminal illness. Uh, it was a rare disease that, that he had come across. And I don't remember what the disease was. I don't know if it was cancer or whatever it was. But he went to the doctor, and he was getting some good care. And the doctor said to this, uh, this young man, he was married and had a couple kids, the doctor said to the man, he said, whatever you want to do, I highly recommend you do it within the next 20 years. After that, you're on borrowed time. Now, he wasn't giving him the death sentence per se, but he was saying that this disease, whatever it is, is going to progressively get worse. And uh, if, if, if there's something that you really want to do, do it today. For tomorrow is not a guarantee. Well, this man had always wanted to plant a church. Now, he was a pastor of a church, but he never, he never planted a church. And for some reason, God had worked in his heart, and he wanted to plant a church. So he went home and prayed about it, talked to his wife and even the church family, and said, you know, God has laid this on my heart. I always wanted to plant a church. And the doc said, I don't have any good years left. This is a debilitating disease, and so if I'm going to do it, I better do it now. And that man gave up the pastorate and went out to Cleveland, Ohio, to plant a church. I haven't followed him. I don't know where he is or what he's doing. I, I should probably look him up. Uh, but but I, I thought that was profound. Uh, now, maybe some of you might want to not want to go plant a church. But that was something that God had put in his heart. And he said, you know, I was, I was thinking somewhere down the road, maybe I'll be used the Lord to do this. Doc said, you're going to do it? Do it today. God says to you, you want to do it? Do it today. Surrender all your earthly possessions and desires. Give it all to the Lord. Serve Him today. Give Him everything you have. We don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. God does. And when tomorrow comes, God will give us answers for tomorrow and the days to follow. But don't, don't put all your eggs in the basket of tomorrow or the future. There's no guarantee. So here's what I want to say. Enjoy what you have. Be blessed with it. Don't, don't be consumed with it. Don't be looking for more. I'm not saying that you don't work harder and you continue to say, I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying don't make that be your end goal, the ultimate desire. There's more to life. And I sure hope that God plays the vital role in all of that. So, left wanting. Man is deficient and left wanting. He is but dust and he falls short of the glory of God. We are no match for God. Our dilemma is we have so much, but is that really enough? Are we better off with all that we have? Our discovery is the answer to these two questions. God. He's the answer. Let God be God in your life. If you can do that, I dare say you'll be blessed. Blessed beyond measure. And you can come to a text like Mark chapter 10, verse 29 and 30 and Say, you know, by God's grace, I did just that. I, I gave it all to the Lord years ago, and, and uh, I want nothing to do with that. Um, you know, I mean, I could go on and tell stories. Um, I probably should just end with that. I'll save the story for another day here. Let's thank the Lord for our time. Father, I, I pray that we don't go through life wanting, craving, hungering for more. Lord, help our people to understand that there's a difference between being a good steward, planning, and making preparation for the tomorrows. But Lord, I pray that we're able to distinguish the difference. We don't get all wrapped up in it. It's not the end-all goal. 
There, there's more to life than tomorrow. Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand that today is the day you've given us. And we want to use all that you have given us for your glory. We want to further the kingdom, the gospel. We want to be all that you want us to be today. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to focus on, on that aspect of life. Surrender it all. Give it to you and watch what you will do with it. Lord, in the interim, you've given us brains, you've given us minds, we can think, we can, we can, we all have plans for tomorrow, this week, this month. But we, we that are still working, look forward to the future, maybe a retirement. We'd be fools if we don't make some preparation for that, but that's not our end all. Just being a wise steward. Our end all is with you. It all began and ends with you. And I pray, Father, you'll give us minds to be able to plan the future to a degree, but as well, Lord, give us a heart that is surrendered to you to really be the, the person that you want us to be. We don't want to be a people left wanting. We have so much. And truly, we are better off when it revolves around you and your plans for our life. And Lord, for that, we give you praise. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Let me just ask you this question. Where are you on that spectrum? As a believer in Christ, where do you line up? Are you still holding on to things? Is it still your plans? Is it still your agenda? Is it still what you want? Or is it God? When was the last you said, God, what is it that you want of my life today? What, what, what do you want of these possessions? What do you want of my children? What do you want of those things that are near and dear to me? Lord, I want, to, I want to know what you want of all that. It's not what I want. As a believer, will you throw up the white flag? Surrender. God, I want what you want. For my life and for the life of those that are near and dear to me, all my possessions, I want, I want what you want. Will you do that as a believer in Christ? And I pray that in the quietness of your heart as God is speaking to you in any areas of, those, of your life, I, I pray that you'll just surrender today. And Lord, you can have it. I'll be farther ahead, much better off. I hope that's your heart as a believer in Christ. Will you reflect on that for a minute? It's very possible that there are unbelievers here with us today maybe watching by way of live stream. We often offer this kind of an invitation to a, one degree or another. But it's very possible there are people here today that have never been birthed into the family of God, never have been born again, never gotten saved as it were. These are terms that God uses in his word. It simply means believing on Jesus and him alone for salvation, not in a church or our good works, the things that we have done to please Him. No, it's salvation is by faith. Are you saved? Do you have a relationship with God through faith in Christ? Not religion. He's not interested in that. Do you have a relationship? Do you know God? Do you walk with God? If you're here today and you've never been saved, we'd love an opportunity to open up God's Word and show you how you can be gloriously saved. Gloriously saved. And so if that's your heart's desire, we would love uh, that opportunity. And maybe, maybe you'd be so bold as to simply raise your hand and say, Pastor, please pray for me. I'm, I'm not so sure I'm on my way to heaven. I'm not so sure I have a relationship with God. In fact, I know I'm not saved. I'm not born again. I have religion, but not relationship. And if, it's, if that's you, would you just simply raise your hand nice and high? And raising your hand will not save you, but it will indicate to me you recognize your need. And I'll be, God, be glad to pray for you, try to help you in any way I can. Yes, I see that. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Anybody else? Pastor, please pray for me. I'm not so sure I'm saved. And I, I need to get right with God through faith in Christ and Him alone. And if that's you, would you just simply raise your hand? Yes, I see that. Thank you very much. Praise the Lord. Appreciate that. Amen. God is working in your heart. Don't delay. Settle it today. Honestly. Most important decision you'll ever make. Believe on Jesus. And thou shalt be saved.
I'm going to ask the, the two that raised your hand, if you would uh, just look at me just for a second. W could you just stay behind for a few minutes here so we could talk to you, open up God's Word? If you could just stay for a few minutes behind, we'd be glad to just to sit down with you and open up God's Word and just share with you on a very personal matter how you can be saved and know that for certain. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to make you walk an aisle, but I hope that you'll come to me at the end of service. I know who you are and you know who I am, and so look for me at the end. I'll be in the foyer, and uh, we're going to see if we can get a few minutes to sit down and talk about the things of God. That would really be good. So if you could help us out to that end, that would be much, much appreciated. That'd be great. Maybe there's others. And I want to encourage you to wa uh, give serious consideration to the matter of salvation. Father, again, you've blessed us. Uh, you, you have been more good to us than we deserve, and that's the truth of the matter. Uh, may you get glory from our lives, and we're going to thank you for it. For it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen.